My name is Matt Butler. We're here to talk about secure coding best practices. So if that's not what you're here for, you're in the wrong room. So there's a couple over there that if you wanted to go now, this would be a good time. 10 minutes from now might be slightly awkward. Uh, a little bit about me. This is actually my first time at this conference. Um, I've spent most of the last three decades in national defense, law enforcement, network security. So writing systems that either protect against uh, these kinds of vulnerabilities or penetrations or actually having to be defended from them. Uh, this talk came largely out of the experiences that I've had for the last 30 years or so. Um, I hope everybody's awake because we have 275 slides and a demo. I'm just kidding, we only have about 50 slides. Um, we do have a demo, uh, but the talk is interactive. Interrupt, ask questions. This is more of a conversation because everybody here is affected by the material that we go over. Uh, just as a show of hands, um, how many of you have some sort of secure coding or secure uh, security testing going on in the environments that you work in? Okay, that's about normal. Most people don't because we don't think about this. So um, this is, I think, our biggest problem. <laughs> <laughs> That cat's in trouble. <laughs> and I love the look on the eagle's face. It's like, really, Tinkerbell? That's how you want this to end. <laughs> but it sort of shows the way we think about hackers. We have a tendency to think of ourselves as the cat because we feel like they're the ones who control the engagement. They're the ones who decide what happens. What we forget <coughs> is that we're the ones who own the software, we own the network, we own the environment, we control the engagement. And that's what this talk is really about. The only thing they get to choose is the timing. So there's three lies that I've told myself over my career, um, all of which have to do with this. The first thing is, well, my code's been reviewed. And we've all told ourselves that right after a big bug is found, you know, why well, didn't get caught in the code review. Uh, my code runs behind a firewall, I don't have to worry about security. The problem is the new law of the jungle is, is that being behind a firewall is not gonna protect you. Um, the last one is we're too whatever to be a target. We're too small, we're too big, we're too remote, we don't have anything anybody wants. The reality is, is none of that is true. Every company has money, so at a very minimum, they'll be coming after the money. Um, what's really, I think, distressing about the way uh, penetrations are happening is really the motivation behind it. Um, and the FBI tends to be concerned about this too because we're going to a much darker place than we've been before. It used to be that hacking was just about the money. It might have been a nation state was looking for technology. But what we're seeing is a lot more penetrations into things that have to do with people's safety. Uh, last year, DHS managed to hack into a Boeing 757. And Boeing's response is, we're not afraid of flying, which is wonderful. Um, considering they're probably not flying a 757 at the time. But the fact that they could get into an aircraft and get into its vital systems, in, in this case it was sitting on the ground, doesn't really give us much comfort when two years earlier a passenger had managed to hack into almost 20 aircraft that he was on, not necessarily getting into the flight controls, but getting close enough to the flight controls that if somebody did that, you could bring down the jetliner. Um, to give you an example, the FBI right now, it used to be when you did a felony car stop, you'd get a car in front, car in back, car on the side, and you basically box them in. Now, they just send out a signal, get close enough to you, send out a signal, they turn off the engine, they lock your doors, and they deploy your airbags. And that's how they take you down today. No more having to do anything physical. So we're developing a whole host of vehicles and transportation that are connected to upstream servers almost daily or at, at 24 hours a day to the point where if you can penetrate that upstream server, you can now get down into the, the machinery of the vehicle. Um, and that's the, the part that is really, that's the scary part of it. <coughs> so the most dangerous real estate um, on the planet is not in Syria. Uh, it's not in the Middle East, it's not in North Korea. It's the internet. Because at no time in our history has it been possible for a single individual or a small group of individuals to be able to launch an attack 
all the way around the world against a country, against its critical infrastructure, like its banking, its finance, its power systems, uh, with little ability for that government to respond. They can literally do it from their, from their living room with their pajamas on. Um, what I can tell you after 30 years in this business is perimeter security is not gonna protect you. You need it because it raises the bar, the same reason why you lock your doors. But what we find is that the bad guys have the best hardware and software that money that other people's money can buy. So they go and they take down a company, they pull 20 grand out. If they go buy the hardware to they need, they have all the time in the world to go and practice penetrating that particular firewall or that particular network. What I always hear when I talk about when I talk about this with somebody uh, like a somebody in the higher up in management is there is this perception that your odds of being targeted are very low. That's just a perception because the way we scale software that we write directly translates to the way you can scale penetrations into a system. Once I have my package, I can go and I can put it against any company that I want or as many companies as I want looking for those vulnerabilities and it costs me nothing to be able to go on to those next companies. But what I always tell them is that you may have a low chance of being penetrated, but it's like being shot in the head. When it happens, it's gonna be a disaster. Um, what we as technologists have to understand, especially if we're writing stuff that's running on hardware or if it's running inside of a system and it doesn't have anything outward facing, is that there aren't any safe spaces anymore. They're going to get into your perimeter. There is an entire laundry list of companies that had outstanding perimeter security and they all got penetrated and they got into their inner workings. And what they'll do is when they get inside, they're gonna be there for a while before you'll even find out that they're there. And they're going to, the first thing they're gonna do is build in back doors so that they can get back in. And when you do find them, they're gonna keep building back doors as long as you haven't gotten them completely out because then it becomes a race. And while they're in there, they're gonna do some pretty horrible things to you. So let's talk about the they. Um, so nation states, any, com any nation state that has geopolitical or geomilitary ambitions has an offensive hacking system or program. Um, it becomes one of those keep your enemies close, keep your friends closer. They'll hack anybody. That's just the way they do it. What, be is, what I think is really um, most scary is just simply that when they find these exploits, they will weaponize them so they can deploy them easily into the field, but then those weaponized exploits get into the hands of the second group, which is crime syndicates, people who are looking for money, they're looking for technology, and every country that has internet access has them. Uh, the third group we talk about that we often don't think about is business to business. Uh, Nortel, Nortel Networks has the distinction of being um, sort of the poster child of having been driven into bankruptcy by a competitor who was actually in their networks for almost about 10 years. They were into everything, their executives' emails, their business plans. They knew exactly what, when they would have to go after a contract, they knew exactly what they were gonna propose for that contract, how much they were gonna ask, and so this competitor, this competitor was constantly underbidding them on their contracts. Uh, eventually, it led them um, into bankruptcy, and that's an example of what we call an advanced persistent threat. You've been penetrated, they're in there for a very long time and they're doing lots of damage to your company. Um, and then I put the fourth one on here mainly just because uh, for completeness, but uh, strangely enough, we talk about um, all of these data breaches, but in reality, it's the insiders that are responsible for most of the data breaches. People who are already in positions of trust, who take that information and either go to another company, sell it to a competitor, or in the cases of espionage, to another government. So that's not one we're gonna talk a lot about today simply because there's not a lot we can do about it. It's not the systems we write, it's not the code we write that really does anything that can affect that. So we have some terms we need to, um, to discuss. The first is what is a critical system? Well, there's the system itself. We have the system that allows us to do whatever. We're holding credit card data, bank data, we're holding something of value that somebody wants. <laughs> Um, but it also includes the other systems that can interact with that system, no matter how low priority those systems are. So processes that are unrelated, 
hardware like printers, um, external systems, anything that can talk or in any way interact with that particular system has to be considered part of a critical system. So the next thing we have to define is what is an attack vector. So um, buffer overruns, as far as our code bases, is still absolutely the number one and the most devastating attack you can launch against somebody. Same thing with uh, code pointer expo exploits because they allow you to run arbitrary code on somebody else's system. Um, move uh, ever fashionable, moving up is a denial of service. Um, that's usually undefined behavior. I send you garbage data, your system chokes on it, it goes down, it resets. I send you the same data again, and you just keep doing this over and over again so your system doesn't work. Uh, there are others like SQL injection attacks. That's number one on the OWASP top 10. OWASP is an organization that talks about, that deals with uh, web-facing applications. So if you're writing JavaScript, you probably already know about OWASP. Um, today, I'll walk you through a, using a buffer overrun to run a privilege escalation attack against a Linux box. Um, and then we'll do it live. I've got a, a VM that we can do it on. The important thing when, it when we talk about attack vectors is that getting into a system is kind of like an air disaster. There's never one thing that brings down a jet. And there's never one thing that allows somebody into your system. It's usually a chain of events that if you can break the chain, you avert the disaster. So when we talk about code, one of the things we'll talk about today is, is where the vulnerability is tells you how important this is. If it's something down in the kernel level, it's something you absolutely have to deal with. If it's something in a low priority system with very few privileges, Maybe that's something you're, you, can, you don't have to be as worried about that, but when you're talking about, you always have to look at what, what the system does and what its privileges are. Uh, the next thing is attack surfaces. So an attack surface is any external facing interface. So if you're running any kind of web system or if, you're, if you have any kind of input from somebody, the attack surface is gonna be your network connections, user interfaces, authentication points. USB is an attack surface. So somebody sends out a mailer, one of your employees gets it. Hey, it's a free USB, we're just trying this out. What's their first impulse? Tear it open, let's take this thing for a drive. The problem is, is that it, that has just now become an attack surface into your system. And since they're logged on with a reasonably privileged account, whatever privileges they have, that virus can now use it as well. Uh, but it's also our internal interfaces. How many people here write systems that have multiple processes that have to talk to each other? Yeah, almost everybody. But none of us really do anything to protect our IPC traffic. We don't do anything to authenticate it. Well, no, but uh, most of us don't. Um, I'm sure there are exceptions to it, especially if you're for the product lines you're in. Um, but the other thing is CLIs. I come from the hardware world. One of the things we would always do is we'd go drop these nice little CLI down on the hardware that ships so that the field engineers can do the things they need to do, except we don't authenticate those at all. So somebody comes in, and what's the first thing we do when you type a CLI? Gives you a nice usage chart. Oh, I didn't know. That would allow me to go ahead and reset the system. I'll just write a little script that just sits there and perpetually resets your system. Command line interface? So uh, the question was, what's a CLI? A CLI is a command line interface. If you have a, a process that may be listening on an IPC port, but you want to be able to do things outside of the UI, you would drop a, another binary on there that's a CLI that actually talks into that IPC port, and it's got a usage chart that gives you things that you can do. Um, Telnet? Yeah. yeah. So the first, the first place we have to go is that we build security in layers. In the same way that you have perimeter security, that's not the only line of security. What you, when, you, when we talk about securing a, an environment, you build the securities in layers, and for us, and what we're talking about today, the last layer is the code itself. So let's look at some code. Um, I picked these out of the common vulnerability databases because I was really just looking for things that I thought were interesting and that would sort of tell a story. So I didn't come up with these. These are not, they're not meant to be tricky, but they are vulnerabilities that we do know exist in, in current code. So what's the vulnerability with this? Who knows how, how long length is? Exactly. <coughs> yes, this is a buffer overflow because we don't know and we don't test to see whether length actually fits in that buffer size. Correct. 
Now the, the box on the right actually comes from um, CERT. So the top one is the severity. This is perhaps one of the most, buffer overflows are the most devastating. If you can make it work, it's one of the most devastating things you can do to a system. The second one is the likelihood. So this is highly likely, we miss this a lot. Um, and then the um, remediation is the, the medium. So how do we remediate this particular code? So we could use standard string. I mean, it's, it's heap allocated, it's not on the stack, unless it's a small string, but I think they got rid of the small string implementation when we put in move semantics. Um, it's good, passes code review, <coughs> ship it. Any problems? Well, you're assuming the file name is null terminated. Well, it's not, it's not you're assuming it's not null to begin with. Right. right. But I'm also but assuming. In this case, if you pa is it valid to pass a null pointer into a string uh, constructor? Yeah. Well, let's assume the string is valid because most buffer overflows are null terminated. <coughs> okay. Because you don't want to, you don't want when it's trying to sure. do the buffer overflow for it to mess up, so you do null terminate. <laughs> The problem here is actually that we have it in a heap allocated string, but we're actually going back to something that's going to be sitting on the stack again because we're calling C string. So we're actually passing this into something that's going to put this back into a stack somewhere or may potentially deeper down. So all you're doing if you do this is just deferring the bug. You're pushing this far, farther down in the stack and you will lose sight of where that code actually came from. So a better choice here is if you're going to error out then check the links and error out because it may be a valid string but it's just too long but then go ahead and null terminate copy it into the buffer null terminate and be done with it if you pass it into a string you never know where it's going to wind up Yeah, I'm just dealing with the buffer overflow at this point. Um, I know it's a null terminate and it fits in my buffer, so I can't overflow the stack here. Yeah. So are you going to explain that? Because I've never understood this. I've been code this for many years, but I've never understood how you actually can cause something bad to happen but by, or how you would even know this. Is, this is I'm going to walk you through a buffer overflow exploit, and then we're going to run one live in a VM if we have time, where we use a privilege escalation attack to get go look at, say, the shadow file, which you shouldn't be able to look at. Uh, how about this one? Again, int, uh, uh, int var is, who knows if it's an enum type. Right, exactly. It may not be in this enumeration. It may be five or six, it may be completely indexed out of range. Yeah, so it's this one, which is undefined behavior. Now, uh, this changed uh, in C17, this became undefined behavior. Before, it was an unspecified value. So that makes this a little more dangerous than it used to be. Um, so we can remediate this by using something we already have in modern C++, which is a strongly typed enumeration, and tell it's an integer. If it's outside the integer, we don't care. It still fits in an integer. We're not overflowing anything. We're not doing it. As long as this is an integer being passed in, then we don't have a vulnerability here. Uh, let's try this one. You still have to check the range though. Well, you, you're going to check the range at some other point, but it's not going to do anything bad because you're pushing an integer into an integer. Understood. Uh, excuse me, can yeah. you go back for a second? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is the actual problem here? So the problem here is you're using an enumeration that comes from the four modern C++. Yeah. So you have no way of knowing, because you're not doing the check until after this enumeration, you have no way of knowing how the compiler is going to interpret that and it becomes undefined behavior. Like, for example, the enum type could be assigned by you. And maybe for some, I don't know how it would assign people to do this. Or to use. Right, and they have this as a medium vulnerability. This is going to cause undefined behavior. This is not going to overflow unless you're talking about passing something much, much bigger in. Basically, how you exploit depends on uh, your compiler. And the, yeah, your your compiler and how badly you wrote the code and all that. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's try this one. Let's pick on standard template libraries for a minute. Sorry, I forgot to repeat the question. Is copying in desk, the desk does not, is not necessarily have buffer allocated. You'd be 
better off doing a back end server. Yep. In fact, that's the problem, and this is actually a buffer overflow on the heap uh, because you have, uh, and that's a high severity because you're not, in fact, dest is actually zero. You, you haven't allocated anything yet, but you're just copying into a, what amounts to an empty vector. So the remediation of that, just do a reserve, or like you said, do back inserter. Um, but you have to, it's an easy mistake to make because unless you've read copy, you won't know that copy is actually not doing an insert. Copy is actually just doing a memory copy. Yeah, but you're doing, you're doing a reserve that allocates memory, but it still doesn't say I have any elements in yeah. the vector. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, right. yeah. So my screen, my uh, my screen code has a bug in it. Um, the other thing you could do is just go ahead and and create it in the in the constructor. Create the size or use back inserter where the destination the constructor begins. Takes a constructor oh. takes a range. Constructor takes a range. Takes a size. Yeah. It just takes a pair of iterators. I think so too. Yes. Okay. And so you should, could could you just do it in the just constructor. easily do it right in the initialize the list. Yeah. So and I don't think I did. I didn't do a slide that had back inserter on there. I just had it in my notes. The other thing is is uh, standard fill and standard transform all all do the same thing. So you have to make sure that you've allocated the right amount of of space for it. Uh, how about this one? So this is uh, this is what we'd see a lot in legacy code. Um, why? Yeah, that's entirely possible. Uh, that's not the vulnerability I was thinking about. The vulnerability I was thinking about is this while statement doesn't ever terminate if you don't pass a zero. So it simply keeps going on and on and on. This is actually a pretty good vulnerability that's very hard for static analysis tools to catch uh, because they have no idea what data is being passed in here. Uh, so you mean, you mean instead of dots, there's nothing? No, um, you're passing in a range of values, right? But that while loop is waiting for a zero to terminate the while loop. If it doesn't ever get a zero, it just keeps going on and on and on. Okay, so the comment was is that it is the responsibility of the caller to make sure that what they're passing is correct. I agree, but they very often don't. So there are some facilities within C++, modern C++ that allow us to get away from this. So for example, you can use a variadic template. Uh, you can also use a brace initializer list expansion. So this is a case where the newer facilities of the language actually help us <coughs> to get out of some of the problems that we've seen in the older parts of the languages, like especially in some of the C stuff that you see in legacy code. Uh, I think this is the last one. Yep, so it's undefined behavior. We don't know when that lambda is going to be called, so we're passing something by reference that won't exist probably at the time that that lambda is called. Um, it's easy to overlook, especially with people who are unfamiliar with lambdas and haven't spent a lot of time with them, um, but this is actually, depending on how this is structured, this becomes a code pointer exception, where you can actually run an exploit off of this to actually run arbitrary code. Uh, so in this case, you capture by value. We're not really using I anyway. We're just setting it to something else. So um, let's talk about a, a, a buffer overflow exploit. If you've if we've gone through, if you've paid attention to the what we've the, the five examples we went through, every one of them come down to one thing, and that is we've lost situa situational awareness on our data. We're just acting on data without actually having done anything to it to verify that that data is actually valid. And I'll go ahead and give you part of the end of the talk. If you want to make your code as hardened against attack as possible, that is the one thing you can do, is validate your data. Know what you're working on. Um, that 85%, 90% of all the vulnerabilities come down to this. We've lost situational awareness on our data. So let's look at a buffer overflow. So we have some really badly written code. It's the same code we saw before. And what we want to do is find a way to leverage that vulnerability. Now we can do a couple of things. We can crash the system. So we just put junk in and the system will go down. And that makes a pretty decent denial of service. 
we can also execute arbitrary code. So this is the arbitrary code I would like to execute. This is for a Linux box. Um, the part on the right is just sort of a, a C representation of what we're trying to do. We're just trying to write shell. Once we can get out and execute a shell, we have access to whatever privileges that application has. It doesn't seem like a big vulnerability, but some of the biggest vulnerabilities in Linux were parts of the operating system that ran as root or as a high privileged account that someone could run a buffer overflow attack against and now they had root access to the box. And that's what we're gonna do. The part on the right is just the, this is just the assembly code that comes out. And what we deal with is we've got EBX, ECX, EDX, and EAX, which are just the four pieces you need to set up that you would see right there in that execute statement. Um, 11 is just the system call. We're not sending any environment variables. And those last two have to do with where you go and find what you're going to execute. So let's look at our memory. Um, this is a traditional x86. So this is an Intel architecture. If you're on Sun workstations, it's gonna be a bit different. Uh, on the low side, you've got text and data. That's the user space where programs run. The heap is on the bottom, grows up. The kernel is at the top. Can't write there either. Uh, the stack is at the top, it grows downward. The important thing to remember though is even though the stack grows downward, what it starts out is main and then, and then you grow your stack downward, all the memory is still accessed the traditional way. It's still from low memory to high. Uh, I pulled out just to give you the, to show you what a stack frame would look like. So everything uh, in the gold, I took out some of the elements, it's just that I wanted to keep the important things. The gold would, might be main or whatever called you. What's below would be whatever you called or nothing if, you, if you're at the bottom of the stack. Um, so we have our nice big buffer. Uh, the EBP, e, uh, RBP, that's just the frame pointer. And then the return statement though, that's what really interests us because there's an address in there and that address in there is the next code to be written after you hit return. So as soon as your function exits, the address of that return is gonna be where the, the, the system goes to run the next piece of code. So what we would like to do, the way a buffer overflow works, is, is we'd like to somehow change that address to point back to some place where we now have code sitting that we want to execute, which is our shell code. So what we're gonna do, and I know this, this takes a little explaining, what we're gonna use is what's called a no-op slide. So we could do this one of two ways. We have to hit this return, and we wanna point that to somewhere else, but we really don't wanna have to have two very specific places where we hit. Yeah, you had a question. We will get to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and in fact, in my demo, I had to disable all of that. So you, the you can't do it. It's so the question was: I thought that Intel and on all these architectures had things to prevent you from doing exactly what we're doing, and that is true. And and I'll explain what they what they've put in and how you can make sure that your code is actually being executed under those because it does make a difference. It doesn't eliminate it. Yeah. No you can still get around it. It's just a lot harder. So here we have, we know where the bottom of this buffer is, but we're gonna have to try and figure out where that return statement is. And that's actually gonna come into play a little bit later when we go through the demo. But what we wanna do is we wanna hit that return statement and we wanna point somewhere where our code is, but we don't have to be exact. It's hard enough to get one exact address. It's really hard to get two exact addresses out of this. So what we use is called a no-op slide. So this no-op slide is just going to be hex 90s in your buffer. Because when the program pointer hits that and starts executing, it's just gonna bypass all those no ops till it gets some code that it can run, which actually is right about here. So here's the beginning of the exploit. And then there's a big block of what looks like the same address over and over again. So the reason why you do that is because we're not talking about pinpoint bombing here. We don't wanna to have to guess each little piece on them, because then it becomes obvious, because if you overflow this and you blow up the stack frame, you crash the program, and we'd like to crash it as few times as possible because the goal is not to crash the program, the goal is to be able to use our exploit. So we will fill that with a big chunk of the same address, which in this case is just gonna point back into the buffer. 
hits the no-op slide, goes down, executes our code. So in older systems, and this is going to be like early 2000s, they put a lot of this infrastructure into protect about this. Um, it has not come in until like the early 2000s into the compilers and the operating system. So everybody understand that part of it. Remember the 90s, because that becomes important when it comes to finding out if somebody's trying to penetrate your system. And I'll show you how that works here in a little bit. So to your question, the things that have been put in. So since then, we've added a, what ASLR, which is the address-based la uh, layout randomization. Um, you, I've went ahead and put all the, uh, the command line switches for GCC Clang and Visual Studio. Now, ASLR is actually turned on by the operating system. <clears throat> if you get root access somehow, you can go turn it off. Um, so that's one thing that, that prevents them from each time you run the application, your address space is going to look slightly different. Because as, you'll, as you can imagine, I start at the top of the buffer and I start here. Oh, that's not it. And I go a little further. That's not it. Go a little further and then suddenly I've hit it. But if the address randomization is in play, that they have a hard time doing that at this point. We also have stack guards. Now, you can do a stack guard yourself if you really want to. Um, a stack guard is really just an area of memory right at the top of the stack that has a known bit pattern. And if that known bit pattern is changed, you know that they, somebody has tried to overrun your stack. Or you've done it accidentally. But somebody has corrupted your stack. So, um, and we'll talk about safe stack a little bit uh, further down in the presentation. But those are all the command line switches. Now, all of these are turned on by default. So make sure if in your build environments, that nobody has gone and turned any of these off. Because you could be running with this on your desktop where you're doing development, but in your CI builds or in your, uh, your full builds, you may wind up not having that. So what can we do about all this? That, that's just, did everybody understand that example of how that works? How do you get the buffer over from? So I have a buffer that is a fixed width. I give you a string that is much longer than that width. It's null terminated. But you're not calling my internal function. No, you are. Right. I'm giving you the data. You're putting it into something on the stack. You're not validating that the length fits your buffer, like the first example we had. So it just writes and writes and writes until it hits a null terminator. Yeah, so the question is, is how do you wind up doing this? And the answer is, is that you wind up not handling the data correctly. And you're right, it's on the interface. And we'll talk about trust boundaries here a little bit later. Yeah? Not necessarily interface. For example, a function is called allocates local buffer and then tries to load an image to that buffer and the image is received over the network. <coughs> if the image is too large, then the buffer gets overflown. The return address is overflown. And when the function returns from the stack, the corrupted return address is fetched and jumps to the uh, undesirable location happens. Okay, so the comment was probably lo longer for me to repeat, but the basis was, is it doesn't necessarily have to be an interface coming from the outside that a user is going to have access to. It could be an interface of bringing a file over a, um, yeah. over a network. So for example, OpenSSL and its Heartbleed buff, um, uh, vulnerability was a buffer overflow, but it had nothing to do with the user. It was just two computers talking and one of them happened to have a payload in it that overflowed that buffer. You can do the same thing by injecting something in a database. That, in fact, that's part and parcel of the SQL injection attack is I stick something in that, whether it comes from a database or it comes from somewhere else, I stick something in that SQL call that allows me to run arbitrary code. So all of these vulnerabilities, and I'm, I'm still surprised when I see that SQL injection attack is that the attacks are at the top of the list simply because it's been there for over a decade on OWASP's top 10. Uh, it just becomes a case that we don't think when we write code of how it could be exploited. So we're told, like for example, in string copy, don't use string copy. Okay, we don't use string copy. But we use string end copy, but we use it incorrectly. And what we can sort of understand is that we've, we've been given a language here that's actually fairly safe just in the way it's actually created. It's just the way we use it can create these vulnerabilities for us. So did that get your question? Yes. Okay. 
So, yeah, that's true. You can modify that. Might be yeah. So, um, so let's talk about what we can do about it. So Sun Tzu said that all battles are won or lost before they are ever fought, because it's all about the planning and it's all about the preparation, it's all about the intentions. So what we're gonna talk about now is what are the things we can do to protect our systems against people trying to penetrate them. So I took, um, I, hear, I, I love the core guidelines. I use it all the time. I love Clang Tidy. I use it all the time, CPP check. I use all of these all the time. But I wanted to go see how many of these vulnerabilities would they pick up? And the answer was none. Um, the only, yeah. This originally was a none until I realized that in Clang Tidy, almost all the security checks were turned off by default. So in order to catch that one, and that's not even really the bad one because that's sort of the problem with static analyzers is that what happens when you have too many false positives in your static analyzer? You turn it off, yeah. So it's understandable that no one really wants to catch this because all the legacy code out there, you would just be getting these blizzards of, of false positives. So what this tells us is, as good as the core guidelines are, as good as CPP check is, as good as playing tidy and the static analysis are, we have to have something more. So let's look at secure coding static analysis tools. So there's some commercial products, Coverity and Sonar. And these are all based on known vulnerability databases from either CERT or OWASP, or uh, there's a database maintained by MITRE for the government. Um, and you can actually go look and see which ones, which vulnerabilities they'll catch. In this case, I also, I went and looked at their vulnerability databases to find out if they would have caught any of these bugs and they don't cover any of them. Uh, and then we have the thread uh, safety analysis. Uh, we'll talk about that one a little bit later. Rose checkers. Um, which is specifically designed for the CERT C and C++ vulnerabilities. The problem here is, is that you have to build with your ROSE compiler, and what they've provided is a VM that you can run their checkers on, which is a little hard to use, so I'm pretty sure it's not gonna get a whole lot of traction, uh, except in the environments where people are actually using it. You have the AIR integer model, which um, it's looking for integer overflows in your code, um, or potential inter integer overflows. Um, then you have compiler enforced buffer overflow elimination, which is really in the research stages. So <clears throat> then it becomes the question is why don't we have a lot of static analysis tools since that would seem to be the thing we really want to do is catch this at, at compile time. And that's just exactly it, that the comment was it's hard. It's that's just indicative that it is a very, very hard problem. The reason why we don't think it's hard, the reason why we had people who were able to say, oh, well, this is the vulnerability that I'm seeing in here is because the very best pattern matching recognition, pattern recognition system you will ever have is your own brain. If you go back and look at what little kids that are six months old can do and the patterns they can recognize, it's almost stunning the way our brains work and especially the way it processes information. Yeah? Is there anybody doing machine learning research on this? Doing machine learning on this? Um, so the question is, is, is there anybody doing machine learning on this? I don't know. But I think there's enough tools out there that even if we can't catch this at compile time, there's tools we can catch in our CI builds, we can catch it and we can, that we can actually put in our build environments to catch a lot of these vulnerabilities for us. So I don't know that anybody's really taking the time to do that. Um, the biggest thing you have to remember about static checkers is they're based on the rules and their rules are sometimes very hard to write. Going and find and just grepping for, you know, string copy, that's easy. And then there's your rule. Um, but there's a lot of behavior because they can't handle things like architectural uh, vulnerabilities. They, they don't know what the data is that's coming in. Static checkers really don't have the ability to catch everything. They can catch some of the easy stuff, but they don't have the ability, which means we need something more. So what has been developed here in the last few years has, is a series of sanitizers. I don't know about Windows. Um, I'm sure they have um, their own things, but I do more Linux development than I do anything else, so these are the ones I'm familiar with. So you have address sanitizer, which handles things like buffer overflows, and thread sanitizer, which is for concurrency. So there's these four sanitizers 
that when you turn them on and you're running them, they will look into your code and watch as your code executes to look for these kinds of patterns. But these actually need to be used with fuzz testing. Um, and if anybody was in Marshall's talk earlier today, he did an excellent talk on uh, fuzz testing. If you weren't, OS Fuzz is actually Google's continuous fuzzing service. So if you have an open source project, uh, you can submit it to them. They will constantly, they will, you will have to set up your own fuzz testing. But what they do is they run the fuzz tests against it. If they find a vulnerability, they're going to give you 90 days to fix it before they publish it. And if, um, if you do another commit to your repository, they'll automatically run on the new commit, which is a great service, especially if anybody in here is doing open source. Uh, libfuzzer is usually what they use, and that's coverage-guided fuzzing. And what's interesting about that is it will actually learn based on the reflexes of your code. So as you're going in, it will try one thing, and depending on the output, whether it fails or passes, it will adjust itself slightly. Uh, American Fuzzy Lop uses genetic algorithms. That might be um, more what we were talking about here, is uh, using genetic algorithms, things that can learn machine learning to actually learn how your system works. Uh, I've heard Fuzzy Lop was actually used to find uh, the Heartbleed uh, vulnerability and actually found it fairly quickly. So we have dynamic analysis tools that we can run after the fact. But what you find in these is that it's really going to be as good as your test cases or as good as the test harnesses that you're using. If you're not using anything, I would try either one of these. Uh, you will have to write test fixtures for them, so you'll have to have the entry points, you'll have to, and then it will handle the testing, but, um, so it does take some work on our time. It's not, the value added is not free for, for this, but they are really great tools. The combination of the two is, oh, you overran your buffer right here. So they will, so the sanitizers will be able to tell you where you have undefined beta, where you have buffer overflow, where you have resource contention. But we need to go a little bit further because one of the things, for all of these things, what they do is they test the code. And they test the code's reflexes depending on what you put into it. But what they don't test is your architecture. Remember we talked about CLIs and we talked about IPC mechanisms and how once you're inside the wire, if your IPC mechanisms aren't doing anything to authenticate or anything to test to see who that data is coming from is valid, you're open up to a, a DOS attack from within your own environment. So penetration is um, actively looking for vulnerabilities in test servers, and it really is sort of a different way of thinking. If you need to be frightened or scared, marginally terrified, go to DEF CON. Um, one, of the, one of the pieces of advice you get when you go to DEF CON is leave your electronic devices at home. <laughs> yeah, go take a burner phone. That's, that was the comment, is take a burner phone. Um, these, the people that go to DEF CON are absolute masters at penetrating a system. Uh, I had one of my staff a few years ago, and he was outstanding. Um, I've never known anybody that could pull a system apart and look and see and be able to know what was going on inside that system. There's a lot of people there, that, a lot of the people that go there are people who, who actually do white hat testing. So they're going to go and and they're gonna penetrate your system and show your system where the vulnerabilities are. Because what we find is that most of the vulnerabilities actually start at the architecture stage. Because we're not really architecting for security, we're architecting for performance, we want functionality, we want scalability. So we, want, we, we don't think about security as an aspect at all or even uh, after we've put the system together. Now the third bullet point I actually thought Long and hard before I put that in there is let the hackers help. Um, this is not my company speaking. Um, I'm, this is not their advice. This is my personal advice. Um, you could, if you wanted to find out how quickly your system could be penetrated, just go set up a honeypot. Don't make it a segment off your network. Don't put it inside <laughs> your firewalls. That's happened. It's a physically separated network. It's got your system in it, but it has garbage data in it. You'll be surprised how, once you publish this and it's out there, how fast people will come and try and penetrate it. I mean, it's a game. And a game which a lot of people are very good at. But you're going to find out just how quickly your system is going to get penetrated, where they're going to go. But you need to make sure it's a physically separated entity. And 
Uh, obviously, get your company's position before it. Again, this is my personal suggestion. I'm not speaking on behalf of any company I work for or have worked for in the past or will work for in the future. You actually, you actually don't need to do that. There's a couple of years ago, there's an Ars Technica article. Uh, one of the writers did exactly that, put a Linux box completely unsecure out on the open wire. He got hacked in less than five minutes. Oh yeah, okay. so the, the comment is, you, I, don't, I don't need to do what? You don't you need to do that within your company. Don't, don't, oh don't, yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. Don't subject the company to Okay, this. so the comment was is you don't need to subject your company to this and put it inside, go put it outside the wire, just put it on the network somewhere and let somebody, and that the, the person who did this for an article got yeah, hacked in five minutes? Less than five minutes. Yeah, awesome. Uh, what's really interesting um, is that you, when you go find out where all the IPs that the uh, attackers are coming from, it's sort of interesting to, to find that. Secure TDD, anybody here do test driven development? Well, just a few. So for those of you who don't do test driven development or don't like test driven development, it's basically a way of taking your class, writing all the test cases so that they fail, failing them, and then come back and write the code that makes all the test cases pass. Um, you can do the same thing with secure TDD. That's really an offshoot of fuzzing, but you're doing it at a much earlier stage. This is at the unit test level of so this is when you're doing your build and you're running your unit test before you're, commit your, you're going to commit your code. Um, go beyond fuzz testing. So fuzz testing, especially for these, um, is very good at finding uh, patterns. Uh, but there's other things that fuzz testing doesn't handle. Like, for example, none of those fuzzers really handles uh, traffic that is of a particular type, like JSON or um, XML. So if you're writing something that takes those, you're going to have to do this at the DDD level and write your own test cases that send malformed, plus you more malformed um, data into your class to make sure that it doesn't choke. Now the one problem we all have as engineers, and we've all been there, is that we write this pretty piece of code, we have this wonderful solution, we're very proud of it, we've tested it, it's held up, it's done all the things that it's supposed to do. But when it comes to testing is we're really bad about just hammering on our own code. Uh, there is, and we call it confirmation bias. I write the tests that make sure my code pass. I'm not doing it intentionally. That's just the way human beings are wired together. Don't test your own code. Give your code to somebody else and let them go and do mean things to it. Uh, and, th and this is a much harder, and I put this on here, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, a little bit later, is don't allow release dates to control your testing. It's very easy if you work in an agile world, um, okay, I've got my two week sprints. But somebody has made a commitment to the market out here. And what we tend to do, even in an agile world, is we tend to sacrifice quality up front, and then we try and get all the testing in sort of at the end, and then of course QA gets hammered. I mean, we, we all know that happens in the waterfall world, but when you've made a commitment out here to the market, you're really putting yourself into a waterfall model, even if you're doing two week iterations. Um, there has to be something in your testing that says we have to get to this point, and some bugs are worse than others. Vulnerabilities, I don't know what your severity rankings are, one for the places where I've worked is, is the worst. So you have to make sure that those SEV1 bugs are not the things that can be deferred. Any vulnerability is a severity one. Until somebody comes back and says, yeah, it's actually a low probability that, we can, that they can get this, it's gonna have a low impact on the system. So here we're talking to some of the things we can actually do um, as far as writing our code. So how many of us use third-party libraries, use open source libraries? Um, guess what? The bad guys use open source libraries too. In fact, they go do code reviews and they run fuzz testing against it because they want to find out where the vulnerabilities are. So when they find out that you're using it, they'll know how to go and exploit your code. So one of the things that you can do is writing security wrappers for your third-party libraries. So I have some library that it's it's a hardware dependent library i can't get through i can't do anything with without using this library but you can write a security wrapper around it that validates the data that comes in and comes out and then also handles exceptions now i know especially in my domain in hardware uh, we have a tendency to turn off exceptions because we think they're bad the problem is what we're turning off is our ability to do something about the exception not turning off the exception itself there are some things in standard template libraries, and I use them in the embedded world. Uh, for example, if you pop off of an empty vector, um, it's gonna throw. Um, and 
Oh, is it now undefined behavior? It won't. It doesn't throw an exception. It's always been undefined behavior. It's hmm, interesting. Okay, because I had I had one throw an exception on me the other day, and it was. Okay, so what I'm hearing from somebody who's on the standard committee is it's undefined on behavior. Okay, sorry, I made this. They're not on the standard committee. Um, what you want to make sure is that if something in that library has the potential to throw, like being out of memory, then you can catch that exception without it bubbling to the top of your call stack, and you pay for their crimes. Uh, trust boundaries. Remember, we were talking about validating data. The reality is, is we cannot validate data at every possible step as we're getting it. Uh, because then we're gonna spend most of our time validating the same piece of data over and over and over again. What we can do is create a concept of a trust boundary. So um, in the world that I work, I've got a JavaScript front end, uh, I've got a C++ back end, the JavaScript is sending me information. Now, the JavaScript are great guys, actually sometimes I'm the one who <laughs> writes the JavaScript, um, but I don't always sanitize my data. So if I build a trust boundary between my C++ code and the JavaScript, then that means that I don't really trust anything it's sending me, and I validate everything that comes in through those interfaces. What that means is, is that, for example, if we're sending something that's an enumeration, I've checked to make sure that it's valid, and I have to have an error state to go back to tell the JavaScript side that what they sent me is invalid. I validate lengths. I mean, they're putting in the first name and last name and someone puts this massive string in there, the JavaScript side probably doesn't care, um, and then it sends it to me. I need to validate it at the point of entry. So what I do is I treat everything that comes out of that as foreign data, even if it's my own code. That way I'm sure that that data has been validated the minute it comes in. Um, what you want to avoid is duplicate validation steps. So what you're gonna do is you're going to take these uh, you're not going to build these at every layer. You're going to build the data that every interface that comes in is going to validate it once, and then inside your code, so that you're not constantly revalidating the same piece of data over and over again, you're sure that what you have is valid. So we also have, uh, has anybody heard of the principle of least privilege? Everybody heard of it? Okay, so the principle of least privilege says is that you run with the minimum amount of privileges necessary in order to do what you need to do. But there are times when, for example, that you need an additional privilege. So you will grant yourself that privilege, but then what happens a lot of times is, is we forget to revoke it when we have an exception or when we have an error. And it becomes the same, the same problem we had with, uh, with locking mutexes and then suddenly you error out and you didn't unlock it and now we have RAII. <laughs> this is a place where if you're going to grant yourself additional privileges, use RIIA to make sure that once you've exited out of that context that that privilege gets revoked. Because there's a lot of vulnerabilities that wind up where somebody has granted it, they didn't revoke it, and now once they're penetrated, they've got these escalated privileges. But that becomes only one layer of the protection. That's just another layer. The problem we have, uh, and I see this in almost every code base, um, is that complexity is the enemy. We are really worried about performance. We're really worried about elegant structures. We're, we're really wanting elegant code. But we have a tendency to write complex things that create emergent behavior. And emergent behavior is behavior that surprises you. So something happens, some input comes into your system and you say, well, I didn't know it was gonna work that way. And, that's, and our customers and the people who use our systems are very good at giving us emergent behavior because they use our systems in ways we never really thought that they, they would ever be used. But complexity also makes it hard for us to reason about our code because if you've ever listened to any of Sean Parent's um, no raw loops, no raw synchronization primitives talks, um, whenever you're talking about code that is very complicated in the way it's put together, it's very hard for us to reason about how that code's gonna behave under certain circumstances. <coughs> and then understandability. Uh, the more complex something is, the more difficult it is for the next person who comes in behind you that has to maybe fix a bug trying to figure out, and I stole this from Bob, because he talked about this the other day. Um, in fact, I stole the word directly from him. Um, we need 
to think about the way we write code. It's great to take advantage of all of the new tools that we have in modern C++, but when we write code that is so complicated that there's only one human being in the entire company who understands it, we will lose situational awareness on how that code behaves, we'll get emergent behavior, and then we're gonna get surprised. Um, the next thing is logging. We don't ever think about logging. I don't know about you, but I don't think about logging. But one of the problems we do with, uh, and I need an N on the other, other side of pattern. When you have an exception, a lot of us will just let it bubble to the, call, the top of the call stack and then you well, read the core file later or try and handle it later. One of the things that, we, and we'll look at it here in just a minute, one of the things is the pattern of corrupt memory um, tells us something. Where it's corrupted tells us something. So if you can catch exceptions and log your memory into something through that's easier for you to consume than digging through a core file, it makes it much easier for you to get to the answer quicker and find out where the vulnerability is. The other thing we have to and talk about is what we put into our logs. Um, we're not going to we're not going to encrypt our logs. Nobody does that. It's there's way too much overhead. But one of the things that if you've ever gone through your log, ask yourself, how much could I determine from my system by reading the logs that, are com that come out of my system? Do I put usernames in it? Do I put information that would let me track how things are built within my system? I mean, you obviously need to know it. But the more information that we put into them, these logs are usually unprotected, which means when someone's inside the wire, the first place I go is I'll go look at their logs and see what's in it. You know, how does the system run? And then audit trails. Um, now, I've come from a, uh, a law enforcement background and from a defense background where we needed to have audit trails because I was either dealing with evidence or I was dealing with sensitive information, and so I needed to know who touched that information and was it changed from as it passes through the system. But if you treat logging as a part of your security model, which is when I see certain exceptions or certain things happening, I'm logging them big and bold so they're easy for me to grep, easy to find. I'm not losing these exceptions in the noise. Anybody have any questions so far? Trust boundaries? So, uh, can it become a chicken and egg problem? Yeah, so the question is, is can I build an insecure trust boundary? Absolutely, you can build an insecure anything. How, how do you, in practice, how do you validate that your trust boundary is trustworthy? Fuzz testing, security testing, penetration testing, all the things we've been covering up until now. Um, trust boundaries are not exempt from testing. Uh, they are, if all a trust boundary really is, is I get data comes in from some foreign source, and by the way, everybody that comes into that is considered a foreign source, and I validate the data. Um, I make sure that my strings are null terminated and they're the right size for the context, those kinds of things. So yeah, you can build an insecure anything, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, should I, I find trust boundaries to be some of the most difficult things to manage. Yep. Today's private function becomes tomorrow's public interface. Yes, yeah, so the comment was is that it's very hard to build trust boundaries because today's private interface becomes tomorrow's public interface, and that's absolutely true. Yeah. So, when you talk about exceptions, um, the standard <coughs> library throws exceptions. I, I don't remember if you said, but how, how would you create a boundary there? I'm more talking about third party libraries than I am standard template libraries, because STL is actually part of the standard. Um, and one of the things that's nice about the standard is that CERT is actively involved in the standards committee, so they're actually in helping craft the language so that the language is secure. Now, STL <coughs> is a library, but it's also a library that's been extremely well tested. Uh, it's pretty well known. I mean, millions of engineers use it. Um, I'm more talking about um, open source libraries that are really specific to some domain that you're in that maybe it doesn't have as big a user base, it hasn't been through testing, nobody's fuzzed it, it's just something that is very specific to your domain. Um, that you should not just, because you're using it, trust it. And the way you can do that is to build a secure wrapper around it 
so that you're catching exceptions that are coming out, you're validating go data going in, you're validating the data that comes out. Well, so where do you catch your, uh, the question was, uh, the, or the comment was is that you, you do catch exceptions anyway and where do you catch those exceptions? So where do you catch your exceptions? Is it the top of the call stack or you just let it bubble up and restart the app? It depends on what's going on. Right. So in this case, a security wrapper that goes around a third party library catches it as it comes out of that library so you know it's exactly where it came from. And you can protect against, because their code problems become your code problems. See, I trust the code that I write, and I trust the code that my colleagues write, but I don't necessarily trust the third-party libraries that come in. So in this case, you're just insulating yourself against somebody else's mistake. Anything else? <coughs> so, code reviews, everybody's favorite topic. Um, I don't know about your experiences, but my experiences in the past have been that we tend to take it easy in code reviews. We don't want to offend a colleague. We don't want to be overly harsh with a colleague, especially when they've got some sort of a, um, something that really isn't a bug, but maybe it's not done the best way. What we have to sort of get, and we do tend to focus on form and function. I don't like the name of your variable. Your line wing is too long. Um, what we really need to focus on is correctness, because correctness is part of security. Performance, yes, we all care about performance, but also about the security of what you're writing. Are you validating or do you know that the data has been validated upstream from you that you're not working on data where you've lost situational awareness? The important thing, though, is, is that ruthlessness is a virtue in this case. Because if you don't find the bug in a code review, some hacker's going to find it six months later when you've forgotten that it was actually there. And you're going to have that moment, oh, you know, I saw that bug and I didn't say anything about it. Um, the other thing is, and this, this last one actually came from, uh, I did, I, I've caught myself doing this for a few times. If you guys use Git and Garrett, so you check in and then you, um, uh, you know, everybody does a review and so you've got some changes, you put out a second patch, then maybe a third patch. By the time you get three or four patches in, at, towards the, after the initial commit, you've sort of forgotten about what the commit really was doing to the rest of the, of the code that it was being checked into. So one of the things that I've stopped doing is, is that I don't plus one off an incremental commit. I always go and look at the entire commit in the context of the code that it's modifying instead of doing it off the last patch that was checked in. Oh, because you know, I see they had this comment and they fixed that comment. So. I don't know if anybody else here does that, but I've caught myself letting things slip through a couple of times, and it's something that I stopped doing. Uh, yeah. I would posit that that's a shortcoming of the Git review process. Um, so the comment was is that's a shortcoming of the Git review process. Other code review tools do it much better. Other code review tools do much better. Do you have a suggestion? Uh, we've been using the code collaborator. Okay, so code collaborator? Yeah, if okay. we submit multiple changes, those are always shown in the full context. Okay. What was that one? Fabricator is the same. Fabricator. Okay, so, so we have two other options for code review tools. Um, I liked I like getting Garrett, but it does. You're right. It does have that vulnerability. So the other thing we we need to look at as far as code reviews is legacy code. Um, I don't like working in legacy code. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> I avoid it when I can. Um, but it often has the worst vulnerabilities, especially the longer, the older that code has gotten, the worse the vulnerabilities are going to be in it. Fuzz testing and all the other testing we will do um, does catch a lot of these. You find a lot of it in legacy code and it becomes one of those, oh, I didn't know that was there. Um, but legacy code's really not reviewed because nobody likes to touch it. It's almost radioactive. So, so nobody's really going to go back and review it. And yet that hides a lot of vulnerabilities. So one of the things I would implement um, is actually taking time to go back and review your legacy code from a security aspect. You're obviously, then it'll obviously, if you had a static check or run on it, it'll obviously go through the same process. But a lot of times, a second set of eyes will catch things. And I've had this, I've checked things in, and I've had a second set of eyes, and I just missed it. Yeah, comment. Any suggestion for a, a multiple decade long code base? <laughs> Throw it away. So, so, so the question was, any suggestion for multiple decades long code base? Throw it away and start over. Mm -hmm. Good luck with that. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that's your problem. That's not the one I've got, but yeah, uh, yeah. So 
So code we write today eventually will become legacy for code being written in the future. What is it? What is different about the code we're writing today that than the, co the le code we consider legacy today back then? What did they do differently or wrong that it became that has this reputation of being having bad, worse vulnerabilities than the older it is? Right. So. The question was, is, is that code you write today will be legacy code tomorrow, and what keeps us from writing the, the same vulnerabilities into the code, and my, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, uh, that it becomes legacy code at some point in time? Knowledge. That's why I'm doing this talk. Um, probably few people in here, in fact, when I asked who's got a security program in place, there was like three or four hands. The more we get the knowledge out, the more we think about this, the better the code will write today, so then when it becomes legacy code in the, in the future, we don't have those vulnerabilities behind us where we're not expecting them. So I know we don't think about it, and I'll talk about this here in just a minute, we don't tend to think about security because it's really not the most glamorous part of our job. I mean, we get kudos for writing a really great algorithm or writing a really fast data structure, but we really don't think about security until we get burned. Um, then the last thing is libraries you don't write. Uh, we talked a little bit about open source. Everybody here uses open source. So do the bad guys. So one of the places we need to go in code reviews is to make sure that we're code reviewing our third party libraries. Has anybody in here ever gone and third car, code reviewed a third party library they're using? One, two. To do the entire library? Always, awesome. Yeah, most people will do a piece, but not the whole thing. I mean, you did always, so you're the... Um, trust but verify. You have to verify these things with code reviews. You have to go and look at the code. You, you need to know how it works under the hood because if the static analyzer doesn't hit it, if the fuzz testing hasn't gotten a test case that exactly matches what's gonna kick that vulnerability out, use the best pattern matching system you've got, which is your own brain, to go code review that code. Um, and then favor libraries that have security audits. So um, I don't know if anybody keep, well, this is BoostCon, so everybody keeps up with it, but there's a new library called Beast that got put in by Vinnie Falco. One of the things Vinnie did was he actually went out and had a security audit run on the code. Um, I'm gonna venture to guess most of Boost has not had that. Do you know? No, that is true. You don't know or no, it hasn't? No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't, yeah. Um, and yet you, Boost is ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. I mean, I use it, um, but if, you be, if we begin favoring third-party library or open source libraries that have been security tested, that brings the pressure back to people who are putting those libraries out. Sorry, we're not going to use your library until it's got, gone through security audit. Every commit. Because just because it passed now, just because Beast is pretty good now, I think they found two vulnerabilities. One was minor, one was a medium vulnerability. They thought the minor could be left, the medium one he fixed. But what happens in a year from now after he's had a whole bunch of commits? So, best practices. Uh, I said this before, validate your data. If you want to cut out the overwhelming majority of exploits that people will run against your code, make sure that you maintain situational awareness on your data. If you don't, that's where you're going to get burned. Your architecture will be fantastic, you can have all the security in the world, but it will be the data that you're working on that's going to be your, your, uh, your vulnerability. Um, I know some people already do this, treat warnings as errors. In the same way that pain in our bodies tells us something is broken, uh, warnings in our code tells us something is inconsistent. There's a reason why those warnings are there. The problem is, is that those warnings often get ignored. I've seen code roll out that's got 1,500 warnings. Um, and this is in products that get used every day in the field. Um, you're not going to be able to go from 1,500 to zero in a commit. What you're gonna have to do and what I've what we've had good success of in the past is you're not allowed to add more warnings in your code than you can fix. And the ones that you add get scrutinized even more to make sure there's nothing that you can't do to remove that warning. Some of them you live with, but if you treat them all as, as errors, then those inconsistencies that are in your product will not become the vulnerability someone can exploit later. Um, design, it always starts with the design. If you're designing a new system, the first thing you have to think about is your security model. That's permissions, authentication. Who's gonna be talking to our IPC mechanisms? Am I putting CLIs on my hardware? The best thing you can do is don't put CLIs on your hardware. If you have field technicians that need it, give that to them. Let them go and just run it in place off of USB or off of some other capability so that they can use it, but it's not sitting on the box. So it can't be used to compromise your system. Uh, establish 
uh, a code stand, a coding standard. Everybody here have a coding standard that's more than just line length and names and really no. Um, it has to include security. Becoming familiar with these kinds of, having internal training, becoming familiar with these kinds of vulnerabilities will save you from putting them in your code, uh, but also codifying them in a coding standard so that you're, you're avoiding certain, certain classes of vulnerabilities will make a huge difference in your ability to get the code out without there being a vulnerability something to take advantage of. Um, we talked about static analysis tools, penetration, fuzz testing, unit testing. Um, the big thing is get buy-in from above to make sure this is a re release criteria. This is probably one of the hardest things because you have a deadline. And um, <laughs> any suggestions? So every time I have to have this conversation with somebody, it usually comes down to this. If you don't secure your company and your software, three things are going to happen. One, they're going to get inside. I just guarantee it. Two, they're going to figure out how to get into your banking system, which means they're going to go after your money. After they've gone after your money, you're going to miss payments to creditors, miss your payroll, and declare <coughs> bankruptcy. You can't think about security in sort of a context of the same way we think about, well, what are the odds somebody's going to die on an airplane, you know, where we have actuarial tables to do it. If, if your company is using an actuarial a approach to deciding whether or not they want to implement security in their systems, they are just begging to get hit. Show them this talk, take the material from this talk, put your own talk together, go inside your company because you need buy-in from above and below. And that's really the last two things. Educate yourself, train your team. Um, you don't want to be the security guy. Um, it's absolutely the worst position you can be in because you're always the person who is pointing out problems. And what winds up happening is, is when you don't get hit and they have a security program and you don't get hit, people will say, well, what does he do all day? I mean, we're good, nothing's happened. Um, when you get hit and someone gets inside, it's like, well, what does he do all day? I mean, we just got hit. It's the worst place you can ever be. What you want is an organizational shift. What you want is to put together the evidence, and I don't know who the, uh, the question was, you know, what, how, do you, how do you get this change in your organization? A lot of it depends on your organization. I'm working, uh, I've worked with companies before that have been through this. They've seen just how bad this is, so it's an easy conversation to have. I mean, they're all, I mean, nothing makes my job easier trying to get a company to implement a security plan like a hacker who got inside the wire on them and just wrecked things. Uh, yeah. No, I just want to make a comment that uh, if you do find a good security guy, you should get him. Mm -hmm. We have one, and he established all these practices, including penetration testing, including everything else. If you have that guy, it, it really, really helps. But of course, you can have, have commitment from the company to hire that guy. Yeah. So if you find one, <coughs> grab him. So the comment was, if you can find a really good security guy, grab him, get him into your company, because this gentleman has somebody in his company that put in all these best practices, penetration testing, fuzz testing, all of these other things. Um, and that's true. I mean, it's we would never leave our house open. We would never leave the car unlocked in a major metro. We'd never leave our money sitting in the living room floor. Yet we, it's amazing how stupid we can be at the corporate level where we don't think about securing what is really the most important thing you have, which is your job um, and the company that you're responsible for guiding. And I'm sure that the CEO of Equifax thought they had a really good program and then some hacker wound up showing them just how bad they were. So the other thing to remember is you have to be committed to doing this from an organizational level. Look, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, we've just gotten drafted into the front lines of a war that is between us and them, for some definition of them. And that's the way it is. It's shirts and skins. It's us and them. And we can look at it as, well, you know, what are we going to do? I mean, after all, we have to do all this other work. Or we can look at this as a challenge, the same challenge that we would look at if we're going to go and build some <coughs> grand new system. Uh, what we have to see this as is that when they're in our software, on our network, in our environment, we're the eagle, not the kitty. And if we will look at it from that viewpoint and see this is the challenge that it is, we will stop looking at this as an additional duty we have to do. And now it's just something we do in order for our companies 
to survive. The thing that you have to understand, and this is where the commitment comes in, is you will never know if you've gotten it right. You will only know when you get it wrong. So the fact that you haven't been hacked in two years is absolutely irrelevant because your code base is changing, you're adding new stuff, new features. You will always know when you've gotten it wrong, but you'll never know when you've gotten it right. Um, so I have 15 minutes left. Do I have any more questions? Because I wanted to show you this demo. The demo? Okay, so. So I have a VM here. Security yes, Charlie, I have a password on my VM. <laughs> Which, by the way, is password. P-A-S-S-W-R-D, all lowercase. So if anybody's thinking, oh, I'm going to go hack his VM, ah, you got the password already. Okay, so... I'm sorry? Is your VM available over network? Does it go to network? No. Well, yes, because it's sitting on my box here, and that's connected to Wi-Fi. Uh, okay, so... I've just created a few programs here. So vulnerability, if you notice, there's a file called vulnerable. That's actually running as root, which is not atypical for something in an operating system. Um, you could think of this as something else that would be a uh, something run with higher escalation, uh, higher privileges than, than you are. Uh, I have my very bad code. Um, which all it does is just read bad file. Better? Okay. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to sit down. Sorry, cameraman, but it's hard to... Okay. So I have my very bad code. This is actually... The bad copy is actually the same code we saw before that had the vulnerability in it. We're coming in with a length. We're not checking it. We're just slamming it right into the buffer. Uh, the bottom part in main just reads... Um, just reads the... Uh, the file and then calls back. Now I'm going to do one thing because I actually have a better graphic that will show you. Let's see if it will. I'll do five. Let's see if I can make this bigger. No. Got to go all the way to the end of the slide deck. Sorry. All the way to the end. Is there? I have no idea what it is. I usually just right there. Okay. So. This is going to be a bit different strategy. Um, what we're going to do is we're not going to, we don't have a nice big buffer in our, in our function that we can operate on. It's only 24 bytes. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to run it against the buffer that's above in main. So it's a bit different. So I've added a little more information in here. Main has parameters and the buffer. And then um, when we call the, uh, the bag copy, we have the arguments, the return address, um, and then the... Um, the frame and then and then our buffer and what we're going to do is we're going to start from our buffer and we're just going to write all the way up but we're going to put the um, payload at the end up in main and let me go back down here so keep that in mind and we don't want to update now that would be unfortunate so let's look at you're, st you're still in uh... Better? Yep. Awesome. Okay. Probably not. Oh, control shift plus. Better? Everybody can see it? Okay. So bad file, we'll just hex dump bad file. So you notice up here we have what looks like our address. And that's true. We're overriding the address. We're filling up the buffer we have plus the return, plus EBP, plus all the parameters, and we're covering it because, and this is, this is why we have that big block, is so we don't have to have pinpoint accuracy. Um, and then you have our no op slide, followed by at the very end, you can see the uh, vulnerability. So if the stars align and I run the vulnerability, I have a different prompt. And if I say, who am I? I'm root. And if I want to look at the shadow file, which I can't normally, 
I now can look at the shadow file. So I've used a buffer overflow run to oh, exploit to, hang on just a second. Huh? Um, basically where all the password information is stored. It's the, it's the one file if you really want to break all the passwords in the system on a Linux system, you want the shadow file. Um, this, this is something that only root can access or something with those particular privileges can access. So one of the things, um, why this becomes so devastating is the fact that I now have root access. I can do anything I want on this box. Um, wipe the hard drive, anything. And then once I exit out of it, if I were to try and go and cat the, the shadow file, I have permission to die, because I'm back at me. So what's the list of stuff you had to turn off to make the demo go besides running a 32-bit VM? Um, I ran a 32-bit VM because it was easier. And I, or the question was, what are the, all the things I had to turn off besides running a 32-bit? I had to turn off ASLR. Uh, and I had to compile this so that it wasn't doing uh, any of the safe stack stuff in the background. So this would be, and I mainly did it just to make it easier on myself because it's more important that you see how these work, not necessarily that I can get past all of the things, which I'm sure if I put my mind to it, I could do it. It was more important to put the talk together than trying to figure out how to get past this. Um, but let's, let's look at one other thing here. Let's say I have another one that is exploit fail. Because, and, and all that's going to do, and if you look at the size types, all that's doing is, that it's, is that's creating a bad file that's now 200 bytes long. It's a much smaller file. What you'll find is when someone is trying to penetrate your system is they're going to fail a lot because it takes time to figure out where to get that buffer to to find the sweet spot. So let's go run vulnerability now. And we get a seg fault. Why? Because I'm overriding memory that it's really needing, but it's actually it's not overriding it with the right memory. So if we go into GDB, and we're going to run uh, vulnerability, and we want our, we should have a core file here. Yep. So now we want to go in and we want to look at the backtrace. So we have four frames that we can deal with. There's, there's main, bag copy, and then two others. So what do you look for when you want to find um, whether or not why this is crashing and if it's part of the vulnerability. So let's just look at our bad copy frame first. So now we're actually in that frame and we want to... Can you, can you switch to the text view with the page? What color is A? Probably not. Why do you want me to go to the text? Can you not see it still? Because you want, you want, to, see, you want to see source and uh, where you are. Or Oh, I didn't compile with the symbols in, so it's not going to show the source. And that's actually not what you want to look at. What you want to look at is the stack. So let's look at the stack and see what is there. Helps if it's a dollar sign. So the data on the stack sort of looks unremarkable. I mean, there really isn't anything there that sort of points in one direction or another. So let's try going up a level and see because remember, I ran, my, I ran it against main, up into the main stack. So if I run the same thing again, I look at main stack, notice all the hex 90s. What is the program to do this? Do you point with the mouse? So what you're, what's interesting here is all these hex 90s. And then you've got the repeated addresses up top. And then you've got the repeated addresses up top. Exactly, that's the sled. You're gonna have hex 90s in your code here and there. If you go put something in a compiler explorer, you will see hex 90s. There'll be onesies and twosies. But if you ever get into the situation, you're looking at the stack of something that has crashed and you're seeing hex 90s in blocks like this, that's a dead giveaway that somebody's actually trying to probe your system to see if they can run a buffer overflow exploit. Now, there's other buffer overflow exploits. Don't get me wrong. This isn't the only way to do it. This was just the easiest way to do it. It's also about a million ways to encode a no-op. Uh, so the comment was there's a million ways to encode a no-op. What are they? I can just clear a register I'm not using. I can add zero to any register I want. I can you know, add nothing to the stack point I'm making. There's, 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 there's any number of... Okay, so typically though, if you're using a no-op sled in a buffer like this, you're going to see these x not, not now. Not now. Well, no, not when... 
<laughs> no, it's, okay, so the comment was, is I won't see them now because I've told you what to do. This is actually old school stuff. This is like back in the early 2000s. Yeah, that's what I'm like, this is vulnerability. Yeah, what you'll see if you've got these things turned on is they'll actually tell you, you're running GDB and you dump your core file, it's going to show you that your stack was corrupted. Um, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make here is that how, when you deal with corrupted memory, how that memory is corrupted tells you something. And we need to listen to it. Okay, other questions? Sure. Um, actually, back here. He... Um, so I'm wondering, um, the, the hard-coded address, the port in OT is pretty close to that address bucket, so that's why the, the stuff kind of works, right, when it's longer. Uh, but how did you know that it would be so close? What you're looking for in this, um, this is where sort of the open source part of it comes in, is that if you're in a stack frame, you already know where the stack frame begins. What you're looking for is an address, you're, you're actually looking for an address that's close because that's where you want to put, you, that's the, the pointer you want to point is back into a buffer that's actually fairly close to you. So but how, how did you know that, how did you know where the stack frame was? I played with it. Um, and it was, it was much, it's trial and error. I mean, they, that's what used to be done anyway. Yeah, that's, what that, that's how they used to do it. Anyway, that's really how they do it now. It's just more complicated to do this kind of an, an exploit simply because that uh, we've added ASLR, we've added um, stat guards and all of the kinds of things. Sorry, I didn't so, repeat the question. So I, I, guess, I guess that's the main thing. I guess now most of the overruns aren't on the stack. They're mostly uh, heap buffers then. And then you're doing roughly the same thing. So the question is, uh, most of the overruns are not on the stack. I don't necessarily think that's true. Yes, you can do, <laughs> you can do heap overruns. You can also do pointer, code pointer exploits, which are going to be somebody creates a structure, there's you know, some data above it, you overflow that buffer, there happens to be a pointer right below it that's actually a function pointer, and now you're executing arbitrary code. This is, it, these kinds of exploits are actually, I mean, it takes a certain mind to think these things through and to, and to have a really in-depth understanding of the, it took me a while to learn how to do something like this just because I don't deal in this on any given day. I've got other domains that I have to, to deal in. And you had a question? You had your hand up, did you have a question? Uh, I was just scratching. Okay, you were just scratching something. Okay, any other questions? Okay, great, thank you for coming. <laughs>